Okay. Hello everyone. We are now about halfway through our spring webinar series and this semester we are focusing on teaching with the ACRL framework and today we are going to focus on the research as inquiry frame. I want to give full credit to the content of this to my colleague Kathy Meals who happened to be out today but just know that the work you're going to see here is hers today. I'm just presenting it but I do want to give her credit for that. So today, as with all of our webinars, I want to say welcome and thank you. This session is being recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube probably this afternoon and that recording will be available for rewatch for anyone, so please feel free to share it. If you are attending the session live today, you will receive a certificate of attendance early next week. So today, the research as inquiry frame. Let's start by reading the language of the frame. Research is an iterative and depends upon asking increasingly complex or new questions whose answers in turn develop additional questions or lines of inquiry in any field. This frame conceptualizes research as an ongoing perpetual collaborative project among all of us, both inside and outside the classroom and across disciplines in which researchers ask questions explore, organize, and analyze information related to their questions, and challenge or extend upon the work of others. In order to do research, researchers need to come to their questions with curiosity, the willingness to explore and experiment, the ability to use a variety of research resources and strategies that meet their needs, and the capacity to draw conclusions based on their analysis and synthesis. Analysis and synthesis, that's hard to say back to back. We do research for a reason, to grow our own personal and shared knowledge. We all do research in various forms, in various aspects of our lives. But the research as wing free frame is really helpful in the academic environment where we are teaching students to develop as researchers, scholars, and lifelong learners because it defines research describes how it evolves and grows based upon the previous work of other researchers who have come before us and speaks to the process of carrying it out, how the components of the process build on each other from identifying a research question to finding information to organizing and synthesizing it. It also explains what we actually mean when we say research, what we are asking students to do when we assign research projects, what learning objectives are we trying to meet with these assignments, and what students need to be able to do and feel in order to increase their skills and confidence as researchers. Essentially, this is showing that research is non-linear. Like the other frames, this frame is very conceptually rich and deep, and we could discuss it for days. So let's just focus on a few of the main takeaways from the research as inquiry frame. First, research is iterative. Every research question or project draws upon the work that has been done before, and the process of finding information during the research process itself requires iterative searching. The goal <clears throat> of it is growing the breadth, depth, and complexity of knowledge, both on a personal and a collective level. And because of the iterative ongoing nature of research, some of that knowledge and some of our answers might change over time as more research is done. As we've mentioned in previous webinars, the frames complement each other and overlap. Our next section is actually going to cover the frame of scholarship as a conversation, and you'll see a lot of what we're discussing today will be repeated and emphasized there as well. So the second skill is that research is exploration. We often tell students that research is a nonlinear process. And this is the fun aspect of research. Um, the fact is it can be a little bit messy and that we can go down unanticipated rabbit holes. I know when I'm teaching, I often tell students I go on these Wikipedia learning binges where I just keep clicking from one thing to another to another. And as we do that, we come across new and possibly unexpected ideas. Um, research is exploration. Uh, exploration also means that your path along the process isn't necessarily direct. It's not one foot in front of the other. The path, path almost always involves backwards, sideways steps, looping around on each other, seeing one concept, jumping to another. And so another perspective on research as exploration is that research is not about trying to find evidence for an answer you already know. Instead, it's naming a question finding information about it, and letting the evidence in your critical thinking and analytical skills lead you to the answers. 
And lastly, doing research is not just applying, you know, a definitive set of skills. The skills and the ability to locate information are fundamental and undergird the entire research process as an iterative and exploratory process. Research also requires a mindset that encourages exploration, curiosity, open-mindedness, and resilience to keep going in the face of challenges and to learn new things. So I'm curious, how have you experienced this whole research as exploration in your own work? And please feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, we will have time for Q&A both recorded and unrecorded. So just know you are being recorded right now, but there will be a chance for unrecorded at the end. Could I, could I start off by saying that that's pretty much the whole point um, when it comes to humanities research, humanities writing. Um, and it might be something as simple as taking a particular passage or taking a particular sentence of a particular work and unpacking it, unpacking not just meaning, but possibilities of meaning, possibilities of, um, of, of, of direction, possibilities of looking at other parts of a particular work or a series of works that are getting at a particular point or getting at or responding to a, a particular cultural tradition or a cultural utterance um, or a reaction to something. Yeah. But you don't really learn that in undergrad. No, and you know, that's one of the interesting things that when we work with students, we try to show them, you know, you might not be learning this in the classroom, but you're sort of already doing it. And we try to connect it back to their personal lives. A lot of students don't realize that um, when they're doing research in their personal lives, they're using these skills. Um, and so, you know, we're talking about it's discouraged because um, when it, if you're in, it's 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 like being handed a um, being handed an Uzi, um, and you, and you're barely trained to, uh, to, to shoot a, uh, shoot a pistol. Do you understand? It, it's, a, it's a pretty powerful. And what it means is that, um, <clears throat> if you are in a particular academic setting where that kind of thinking and exploration is encouraged, this is very useful. But more often than not, what I think a lot of students may be running into are settings or situations in which you have somebody who is, you know, has proper credentials and everything else, but they're not really interested in students exploring. They want them to um, meet a particular requirement. Mm -hmm. And so what you end up is, but what you end up with is by the time they hit courses like 210 or some of the other, um, you know, courses in their majors, if the professors themselves are, are not just themselves, product oriented, final product, um, final goals oriented, um, they'll probably get to that particular point. And what that does in fact, is that it discourages students from actually doing um, quote unquote heavy thinking or doing thinking that is not simplistic. We demand that our students think and perform in a in a complex way, but we we are pushing them to avoid doing that at all. And we've just about eliminated all of those other avenues that allow people to think and to express themselves in a creative way. Because when you do research inquiry like this, it that itself is a form of creative writing and a creative exploration, but it's not really encouraged here. And for a lot of people, it's frightening um, to confront the possibility of having an entire classroom of students who are critical thinkers. And so there's sort of this sort of, let's just narrow the, narrow the pack. And that's what you're getting as a result of that. I, yeah, it's, 
Classroom teaching is definitely fundamentally different from what we do at the library. And we're hoping that um, in this presentation, we're gonna share some ways you can add uh, activities that encourage this in your classroom. And as I said, this is being recorded, so do feel free to share it with your colleagues so that they can get the benefit of encouraging you know, critical thinking. I know sometimes it can be scary, um, particularly if you've been assigned, you know, you've got to teach these skills, you've got 14 weeks to do it, but there is always a little time to encourage more exploration and more critical thinking. Well, um, that's why that's 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 why I that's why I, uh, that's why I responded the way that I did. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully, within people's respective fields, um, they will infuse um, more space, more time for creative thinking and for um, for exploration. Key words, key terms, can sometimes tease out much larger, much more complex questions that lead to more complex research um, projects. Mm -hmm. And so before I move on to those, you know, the skills and ideas and those classroom activities, I just wanted to hear if anyone else wanted to add additional comments. I sometimes run into the exploration metaphorically, I think is, is the way my head conceives of that. Where I, we're in libraries, so it's it's multidisciplinary for us, or, and it's always how our discipline inter intersects with another one. So that exploration is like I'm digging into this idea, and then suddenly at the edge of my idea, there's a bridge to a whole nother world that connects to it, and suddenly like there's more to learn. So it's it's what do I learn with this process next? And then there's another bridge, and so it's that is an exploration, you know. Mm -hmm. It's kind of cool. That's a very good point. I know for myself, I keep a running Zotero where I'm just dumping articles. I'm like, I'll get to it eventually, but it's like, I want to learn more about that. All right. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. I, I didn't even realize I put myself on mute. <laughs> uh, um, if, if you don't mind me asking, how many of us sitting here are actually um, either you know, faculty, staff, or administrators that are not in the library? Uh, looks like um, we're about half and half, half library, half faculty. I can't speak to where the other faculty come from in their programs. Um, I just know from the names uh, on the participants list, they are teaching faculty. This is Harry, I'm faculty. Hi, Harry. Hi. I'm in English, what were you? criminology department, a lot of the uh, uh, paralegal courses for law areas. Okay, all right. Research is always great. Um, I'm not in a big research class. That, well, this semester I'm not in big research classes, but research is, is huge if you're going to be a paralegal or, you know, moving forward to even law school. Mm -hmm. But research is you know, it's, it's critical everywhere. And, you know, it's, it's, we just have to infuse in our students. You know, we have a whole lot, I have sometimes self-starters that give me more than I could possibly dream of getting. But then there's other people that, you know, we have to just push forward a little bit because research is, re research is not easy and you have to get motivated to do it sometimes. You do. Yeah. You do, you, you have to get motivated. And um, sometimes you're just look, you're looking for words, you're looking for phrases. You know, sometimes doing um, practice sessions using some other things. Sometimes um, what you can do is you can use, um, you can use um, a music, um, you know, a lyric from music, um, you know, from a song, from a poem, and help people to basically pull that apart, pull it apart from there and understand that words do not have universal meaning, that they are very much impacted by a number of influences. And so one of the things that you learn as an English major is to, um, pull apart meaning um, single words and phrases start there 
um, sometimes you can find hints um, or you can find um, possibilities of, you know, referring to um, historical, you know, <clears throat> historical meaning, cultural meaning, um, religious meaning. For those of us who are looking at possibilities of, um, you know, echoes from um, our past, when I say our past, um, referring to those of us who are descendants of um, human trafficking, AKA slavery, um, traces, echoes of previous religious practices other than Christianity, right? Um, being able to look for that, or for instance, in Shakespeare, echoes of him making mention of people of African descent, um, attitudes and beliefs with regard to um, Black people. When we're, you know, looking at the ways in which Europeans wrote about us, refer to us, you know, traces of where are we seen as human beings? Where are we not seen as human beings? You know, some people would say that we, we did not exist before slavery and that we didn't have anything, didn't have a civilization, didn't have any civilizations, didn't have any religions, didn't have family structures, didn't have cultural practices and that um, we are basically animals who have been trained to speak. That is what it means to live in a society that um, that insists that the that there's a single standard of humanity and human expression, and that it all it begins and ends with all things having to do with Europe. But that means that the entire planet, except for a small group of people, get to be fully human. And so in order for us to be able to dismantle a lot of the stuff that we talk about, um, you've got to use these skills and look at the ways in which people have historically used language <clears throat> and how people have historically um, used meaning. Huh. And so even the concept of meaning is a contested ground. Make sense? Yeah, and I mean, to sort of, Build on that again, you know, sort of jumping ahead to our next webinar on scholarship as a conversation. As with the other frames, this research as inquiry frame articulates how research is not just an intellectual activity, it also involves attitudes and feelings. Um, research is a frame of mind, and that frame covers both the skills you need, what you need to be able to do, but also the attitudes, how you need to be able to think, how you approach your research, and, you know, how you find that approach that is necessary for your success. And so when it comes to skills and ideas, there's first what you do. You know, researchers should be able to develop good research questions. And this is important since the research questions serve as the foundation for the rest of the research process. A good research question needs to have what is called, you know, in the framework and its specific wording is an appropriate scope of investigation. That essentially means a research question that is not too broad and not too narrow. In addition, the research as inquiry frame describes inquiries existing on a spectrum from questions that have been relatively straight, have relatively straightforward answers, you know, math questions, <laughs> things like that, to more complex problems that require in-depth, long-term work and higher level research methods. So a good research question would then also occupy a location on that inquiry spectrum that's appropriate for the context the research is occurring in. You know, what type of setting, what type of assignment, the current skill and knowledge of the specific researcher, and so on. And as we become more skilled researchers, we can work on questions with increasing levels of complexity. And because research is exploratory, researchers need to know and be able to try different methods of research, applying a variety of research skills strategies and resources that are suitable for and relevant in the context that they are researching. So, you know, what is the final research product? What types and amount of information do we need? Who is the audience? The skills and strategies and resources that a researcher uses could vary depending on the answer to those questions. 
And then once researchers have information in hand, they should be able to organize, synthesize, and interpret that information. And that's the part where students are writing their paper, delivering a speech, recording a podcast, or you know, whatever other research assignment they have. And that's the part where um, they have found research, analyze it, arrive at answers, and present to others. But perhaps just as important as those tangible research skills, <clears throat> excuse me, the research's inquiry frame encourages certain attitudes that foster successful research. The first, again, is to conceptualize research as a process of exploration rather than a clear cut linear process. No you know, matter how expert or expert a researcher is, during their process, they will certainly encounter both peaks and valleys and possibly some dead ends, but maybe also new ideas they hadn't come across before. And our favorite, you know, those aha moments, you know, when you're like, oh my God, this is exactly it. Um, so to support that exploration, researcher research requires persistence, adaptability, and flexibility. And these are attitudes that we try to emphasize when we work with students. We recognize the challenges as something you know, that's expected. And we show, you know, this is normal. This is a part of the learning process. And we help them to anticipate and mentally prepare for that me messy process. We often tell students, you know, if you're feeling frustrated, that's when you visit the library. Um, students, especially those who are new to research or new to using a particular resource, um, often they experience the need for exploration and trying different approaches during the research process as failure. And so we, don't want them to get discouraged or give up. So we try to teach them that frustration and research is completely normal. You're not doing it wrong. Um, so we in the library know both anecdotally and through our student um, assessments from our classes that many students come into the research process feeling overwhelmed and anxious. And they're not anticipating you know, that this is complex and challenging. And so when they encounter these frustration, it deepens their negative feelings towards research. And even if we know as teachers and librarians that that's not failure, that's how some of our students experience it. So the more we frame research as exploration and encourage persistence, adaptability, and flexibility, the better researchers they will become both in the classroom and outside of it. And again, research draws on all of our you know, faculties, both intellectual and emotional. And the last item here is simply, you know, get help if you need it. You know, this is another idea we like to emphasize again and again and again. We at the library are here to support students and faculty and staff, really anyone researching. Um, we are here to help you develop your research and information literacy skills. It's not an inherent talent. It's not something, you know, we just get through osmosis. It's something we have to learn and then practice time and again, and it requires growth and evolution. And so we can all learn to become better researchers. I know I myself, sometimes I'm helping a faculty member and I'm like, you know what? I don't know how to do that. Let me figure it out and get back to you. We're always learning. And so I'm curious, what role has frustration played in your research process or how have you seen it um, show up in your students? Uh, this is Harry again. Uh, it, it just depends on, it, it depends from student to student. When we have a self-starter, that self-starter will give you everything, the kitchen sink plus. <laughs> but then you have other students who, for, you have to figure out a mechanism to get them started. I know once I showed a movie in a class and that helped get people started. It was, uh, what was it, Bad Times at El, El Royale. It's a it's a movie. It's a I, th I think it's a great movie, and it got people talking. It got people thinking, and it helped them get help the the non self starters to do more research and get enthusiastic about doing the research. So it it's from student to student. I, I there is no bright line, and there's no one path that everyone can take you know yourself starters you you sometimes you want to say gosh you know you, you, you're great uh you have everything plus i wouldn't have gone this far but then other people and it also depends on that person's time so it's it's very difficult because if somebody has children if someone has a job it becomes very difficult and so it's almost like you have to help the person I believe that everyone could do it. It's just time and motivation. If you have the time and the motivation, you can do it. But the, like Dr. Turpin said, it 
sometimes you need something to catapult people into the project. And that's what I found when I had a research class seems to be seemed to be the most difficult task. Yeah. And so this is actually a good transition um, to discussing some of the ways we can start to teach this in the classroom. Um, while research is an exploratory process, it does require students to spend time and sometimes a lot of time investigating and experience or experimenting with research on their own. So we should set them up to learn those skills and knowledges and attitudes effectively. Um, so how do you teach this frame? Um, we've got a couple of classroom activities and assignment activities that we use at the library that we think can help with this. And the first is a research uh, question brainstorm activity. As the research is inquiry frame discusses, research questions need to have, quote, an appropriate scope of investigation. So developing a research question that has an appropriate scope for a given assignment is something that novice researchers oftentimes need quite a bit of support with. A student might say, well, I'm writing a paper about gentrification. We get that one actually a lot at the library. And that's great. Um, it's an important subject. A lot of our students have lived experience with that or they're, you know, they live in a neighborhood and they're seeing the changes. Um, and there's a lot of information available on that subject, subject, but it's too broad for a research question, particularly if your you know, paper's only three to five pages. And so we ask them, what about gentrification? So what? So we like to use this research brainstorm activity to walk students through research question development, moving from a broad topic to a more specific research question. And doing this also helps illustrate how a really wide variety of research questions can emerge from just one topic. So in this activity, we'll begin with a general topic selected by a student or the class, and then brainstorm the related so what aspects of it, you know, who, what, where, when, why, how, and we do it in the quadrant. And this helps students identify aspects of the topic that could lead to a narrower research question. Students might start, might start with the topic of gentrification, and then through brainstorming, they're able to narrow the scope of it by focusing on either a particular population affected, subtopics, locations, timeframes, and so forth. And the brainstorm helps students develop a couple of potential research questions based on the brainstorm and then the angles they could take and how they focus on it. So this could be done as an individual assignment in your classroom. We like to do this um, as a classroom activity just so students can learn from one another and see firsthand how different people have different viewpoints and experience on things. But you could expand this and make it like a Blackboard uh, program, a weekly writing assignment, something like that. But it really helps students you know, learn how they can narrow their topic to something that is more researchable. And so another activity we like to do following a brainstorm activity is the keyword brainstorming activity. And if you've had a librarian in your classroom, you've likely seen this come up. Um, this is best done after students have uh, research questions. Um, you know, sometimes depending on the time in the classroom, we'll do the brainstorm, students will get their questions, and then we move on to this keyword activity right away. But you could do, you know, this the second week after you give a research brainstorm a research question brainstorm activity. So in this activity, the keyword activity, students identify keywords from their research question. And then they think of synonyms, broader terms, narrow terms, and related phrases that they could also search as well. This might seem very basic, but sometimes spending time on brainstorm brainstorming keywords ahead of time can save students a lot of frustration in the long run because it encourages them to think about what they want to search beforehand instead of just diving into the databases willy-nilly with not really an idea of how they want to get started. It also helps students develop multiple search options and it previews the whole you know iteration process of research. It prepares students to anticipate the exploration they might have to do in multiple databases to find what they need. Um, some instructors have used this as an assignment and again I said we use this a lot as one of our activities. If you're scaffolding these things another activity you could then do is our synthesizing sources activities. And if you are interested in any of these, please contact us. We can send you our handouts that we use. Um, synthesizing sources can be very difficult for students because it asks them to put different ideas and different pieces of research in conversation with one another. But this is where critical thinking gets encouraged. And one of the activities we've done with this, again, my colleague Kathy came up with this, is we give students a set of political cartoons 
on the same topic. And what students do is they review each of the cartoons to identify the major points or arguments that are made. And then they are asked to synthesize points from at least two of the three cartoons. And using cartoons is a little bit more accessible for students, particularly if you only have a limited amount of time. They're smaller. And because they're graphic, students find them less intimidating, but they're rich with ideas and arguments. And you're asking your students to find similar themes and topics and maybe the disagreements between them. And you're asking students to put these two pieces in conversation with one another. And lastly, one we've asked students to do before is a research log. And this is actually a great option to do in lieu of a traditional research paper. In a research blog, students record and comment on multiple searches that they do for their research questions. And along the way, they record, you know, the process they took, the, you know, the resources they looked at, the keywords and search strategies they used, how they assessed their results, and ideas for how to improve their next search. Of course, this also helps students find resources for their research papers. But by completing a research blog, students gain some structured experience for learning the mechanisms of how to search for sources and how to experience the iteration and exploration of research firsthand. It also encourages reflection on the research process and it gets students thinking about, oh, okay, I tried this, it didn't work, so I tried this. And it you know, gives them time for self-reflection to see how research, it's not straightforward and linear. And so these are some things we do commonly at the library or when we're asked to come into a classroom. These are four of the main ones um, we have used. And I'm wondering if anyone has um, asked their students to demonstrate um, the exploratory aspect of research in their class. More likely than not, I probably have. Mm -hmm. I mean, as we're talking, I'm looking at Roland Barthes CZ. Um, and that's a text that you're not going to, you're, you're not, you're, 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 generally speaking, you're going to try not to use um, in, in a 210 course. Um, so you are going to use some of the, some of the methodologies, the coding and whatnot, and you end up teaching that in one way or another. And I sometimes wonder if we might be better off just straight up teaching um, critical theory or literary theory, mm -hmm. um, instead of assuming that students have arrived at a particular point or at a particular methodology of thinking. And it may be that we need to stop assuming that. We're expecting students to write as if they've had um, an advanced level um, of training in terms of how they think and how they look at language and what how language performs in a given um, text, in a given sentence. Yeah, I definitely think that it varies from student to student and the experience they've had. Um, my colleague Kathy and I are actually doing a research project where we're looking at how faculty design their research projects. Um, and while we're still very deep in the middle of this research, what we have been learning is um, a lot of people don't learn how to do research or learn how to critically think about, you know, a text in front of them until graduate school. Yeah. Um, it's just not something that's taught, you know, at younger levels, and it, it has interesting ramifications for how faculty teach students and how they do, you know, develop research projects and all of that. Um, and it's just something, you know, we always think, oh, students, if you're coming to college, you've learned these skills, but it's actually not something that's inherently built into our, you know, elementary to high school um, curriculum. And it's definitely not encouraged at the university level, because if it was the kinds of courses, the kinds of resulting courses um, and the kinds of challenges would be quite different um, for professors. And to me, it, it really is about maintaining a certain level of, of, of power um, in terms of who gets to speak, who doesn't get to speak. Um, and it takes, it, it, it means that you know, you're, you're not going to run into classrooms in which um, students are going to, um, you know, ask questions or present projects that, um, you know, that require 
that sort of, you know, um, engagement. For some people, that's not what they're here to do. Um, if you're a person who's most, who's spending more time on researching um, and less time on how you are imparting this information to your students, then you're not going to be necessarily interested in deepening that sort of inquiry because at best, what you would like to see students do is to imitate or give some impression of potential for going into graduate school to become those complex thinkers, but you're not necessarily interested in your students being able to potentially surpass you or challenge you. It really is a power play. I do wonder, and this is going slightly outside of the bounds of this webinar, but there is a movement for open pedagogy. And with that, students help design the curriculum of the class they are in. Like they're developing the content, they're developing the assignments, and it's more of a partnership between the faculty member and the students. Um, and this is, I don't know when this movement began. Um, it's still relatively new, but it has been around for long enough. We are seeing, you know, um, scholarship on it. Um, but that's another way of, you know, teaching to students research as inquiry because they're forced to ask questions about the overall topic of the class and then help develop the curriculum. Um, right. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah. And well, I mean, I I do have a um, I do have two independent study students who are um, helping to shape. Um, a Dell Hooks course. I had another student um, put together a, a, a syllabus um, proposal for a queer lit. And so there is room for that. And my attitude is, is that um, we probably need to, uh, we need to encourage students to do things like that, you know, put together symposiums um, or or syllabi or symposium or syllabi or web talk or table talk, table discussion in which certain um, issues are discussed and explored. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So otherwise, why are we having them um, perform or put together stuff? For what purpose? And so that, you know, that means that you are, you really are transforming your classroom. Um, and this is whether it's face-to-face -face or whether it's uh, an online class, what you, what you really do want to do is to make sure that your classroom space really is a point of inquiry um, and where students feel as though they are part of the learning process and that it's not them being fed stuff but in fact, it is, um, it's an exchange of information because as a professor, as a teacher, you should be learning from your students. And if you are not learning from your students, if nothing else, the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of what you've attempted to deliver to your students, then you are not teaching, you're facilitating your babysitter. And I would, um, I want to continue this discussion, but I do want to say if you want to learn about this frame and more ways to teach it in your classroom, uh, two great resources are the ACRL Sandbox and Project Cora, all of which are searchable, you know, by level of education you're looking at, by the specific frames and things like that. But I would like to continue uh, this conversation and um, someone has put into the chat, I think the difficulty of exploration is exacerbated when there's too much freedom. In my experience, a lot of students struggle when they are told to pick any research topic and do research. It's easier for a student to start researching when there's an assigned theme or prompt, like a shared film or reading, and then the professor can focus on teaching the uh, inquiry process. Focus giving themes are baked into graduate level work and to some degree capstone courses that make exploratory exploration easier at upper levels. And that is something we encounter at the library. Some students come to us and their research projects are just right about, you know, anything you want. We're like, okay, we need to narrow that down. Or they're told, you know, just this math, right about political science. Well, how do we get down from there? Um, and so what we've noticed is, um, 
professors who give a theme or say, I want you to find an issue in your community, and they find a way to put that personal connection, that's one way of getting students to that aha moment, because when they see how they personally connect to something, they feel a little bit more invested in it, and they get more of that exploration and curiosity because they see how it impacts their personal life. Um, I, I, I agree, but I would also say that even even with that, you still run the risk of where the student feels as though he, she, or they are in effect, um, they're doing, they feel as though they're teaching themselves and they don't feel as though they're being given any guidance. And so um, that's where the teaching comes in. That's mm -hmm. where the facilitating comes in. There's nothing wrong with being uh, facilitating discussion. And mm -hmm. so that's why you have the journal entries. That's why you use popular culture. That's why you use social media. Sometimes looking at trends and looking at the ways in which certain events can have it, uh, have had an impact. It's one thing to read about anonymous deciding to hack Russia. It's quite another thing for a person to write about their experience with social activism online or their experience encountering, um, you know, disruption, you know, to what they're attempting to do because uh, somebody hacked them or they're dealing with an online scammer. So many different possibilities, you know, but therein lies the need for discussion and therein lies the need for students to be able to talk with each other um, therein lies the opportunity for professors, um, you know, or instructors to say to students, well, you know, you saw this trend, um, what words come to mind, you know, what, you know, what have you read here today that comes to mind? What haven't we read that maybe we should read that could get us into discussing this issue? You know, there mm -hmm. is lies those possibilities as well. See what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, and this, you know, this is all a great setup for our next uh, session, which is scholarship as a conversation. Um, so we, I hope everyone attending today joins us for that one as well, because like we've mentioned, a lot of these frames overlap, um, but you're, you're getting at the heart of, yes, inquiry and discussion. You know, they go together. Research is a community. Uh, you know, some people see it as this whole individual process where uh, you're, you know, you're in the library, you're working on your computer, and you're not talking to anyone. But that's actually not the research process at all. Not, and it's, 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 it, and here's, here's what it is. It is a, con it's an ongoing conversation. It's not something that's a sort of a, a beginning and end. You're entering a larger conversation. Um, if you are publishing your findings or publishing what you have been inquiring about, you're entering the conversation and knowing that that conversation um, may get picked up, you know, at latter points and different points. And sometimes if you, for instance, if you've published something, you might want to see well, where has it ended up in other people's conversations where they may have advanced a particular point that you had made, um, or they decided to counter it, or they decided to take it in a brand new direction. And that could lead to your own work um, expanding. So that's the way yeah. I see it. Your comment reminded me, um, there's this web comic called XKCD. And a couple of weeks ago, they put out uh, just a one page panel where it was like, no, don't analyze the data. That will only breed more data. Because that's how research is. You know, you create something, it gets out there and that creates more research, which creates more research. It's just this exponentially compounding thing. And, you know, that goes back to the heart of, you know, research as exploration. You're never done with it. You're always going on. You're always looking for new things, whether or not you know you're doing it. Uh, a lot of the times we try to tell students, you've done research. You've explored all of this. You just, it might not have been in a classroom setting. And so we're, we're always constantly trying to remind students, you're a researcher. You just might not think of yourself that way, but you are one. Well, you're a researcher <laughs> as a consumer. Mm -hmm. Your researcher is somebody who's in a grocery store and you've had enough, to, you know, or if you're deciding, we just got through talking about which grocery stores do we prefer. Mm -hmm. And so you know that you, you're, you're good, you, chances are you're going to get a certain set of results 
or certain possibilities of results if you go to one store or if you go to one particular brand, right? And so you may have some inquiries about um, another product or you might have um, some inquiries about looking at, um, you know, producing new products by using some old reliable ones, or you might decide that you want a new nuance, a new flavor. See what this is, this is about. It really is about expanding on that. I think sometimes when you, if you describe that to people in that way, then research becomes a little more attractive and a little less um, tedious. Mm. I kind of like this. It's, it's making me think about a workshop on uh, how to ask a good question about something in your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, you know, if you're deciding that, you know, that you would like to take a look at, um, you know, new possibilities for um, you know, what you could be doing um, with your diet to make it less inflammatory, to make, you know, so that your skin is not reacting in a negative way, your, your gut's not reacting in a negative way, um, you know, some way in which other things don't happen as a result. And so that means that you have to actually do the research on not just a particular given product, but who makes it, who grows it, um, if it's grown, what kinds of um, what kinds of products are used to um, you know to maintain it. Um, if you're talking about you know a particular cut of meat, you know for those of you who eat meat, you know it 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 it, it becomes something that's much more. Um, complex we already do this mm -hmm. it's just that we we have temper tantrums when we're asked to do it when it comes to books when it yeah. comes to articles when it comes to <laughs> school but when it comes to what we put in our mouths what kinds of cars what kinds of what kinds of computers are we going to use what kind of cell phone what kind of clothes? Where are you getting your, your next set of clothes? You know that you're not going to a particular clothing store if you don't know, if you if you know that you don't like that fabric or you know that you are going to get a certain kind of shoes. You know that you are, you know, for those of you who are into sports, you already know because you do the research and you're always looking at other people's reviews. You want to know whether they're verified, whether they're reliable, right? If you go on Amazon, for Christ's sake, and you want to buy something, what's, what's the first thing you're going to look at besides the, the, the details about what's actually in it? You're going to go to which review, which reviews are the most reliable? That's yeah. actually the number one I example. Want <laughs> That's the number one example I use with students when I'm teaching them database research skills. I'm like, if you can use Amazon, you can use any of our databases. And, you know, I talk about how if you're reading the reviews, you're doing research. Um, yeah, that's Amazon, you know, love them or hate them. They're, they're a good analogy for a lot of things. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. <laughs> Dr. Turpin, I had a comment I made in here. Um, I think I think what you're talking about is having the students um, problem based learning almost where it's their own life experience. But I think the, the really good research teacher and the, the point of the research is inquiry thing is to get them from that point to, you know, it, how do you explore the context of an issue like this? So, so what does it mean that this thing is in the store? And then what do experts say should be done about, you know, this kind of meat consumption or whatever? So then you're getting into scholarly works. And so you're teaching them to ask those kinds of questions and to do right. this inquiry process. Right. How and to make informed decisions in life. And that's really, right. really useful. And, and making in making that particular decision as to and and also looking at some of the ways in which previous perceptions, previous assumptions, or previous labels that have been assigned to a particular product or a particular person or a particular brand 
may not necessarily be based on information that is helpful to you, but may have been helpful to the person saying it because they had a particular point that they were making or particular bias. For instance, my previous assumption that duck was not a healthy food for me, and I based it on the often, you know, labeled kind of experience, oh, well, duck is fatty meat. Well, if it's done correctly, it's not. And actually the fat itself is omega-3s. It's actually healthier. So what have I come, what have I been able to, um, to discover as a result of looking at various foods? Because mind you, I am concerned about making sure that I don't eat high inflammatory food or meats that are going to have a hard time getting through my gut. It turns out that duck is actually healthy, especially from a particular set of restaurants that do what they're supposed to do to minimize excess fat. And they do all of the other things that I like to have, such as the little flat pancakes and the scallions and the duck sauce. Now you're so, just making me hungry. I know, hungry again, yeah. <laughs> right, and, 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 and I'm not specifically referring to uh, uh, duck that, uh, from spices because they can- Oh, they, so good. <laughs> right, and they can, they make it so the, the skin is really crisp mm -hmm. and, they, and they make sure that you're not dealing with greasy meat. And the thing about it is, is that I need to make sure that I have enough protein. Because even though I lost this weight, um, that doesn't make sure, that doesn't mean it's healthy if if you don't you gotta have to make sure you have the right kinds of foods. So in my case, I have to have the right kind of food, but it has to be non-inflammatory, and it needs to be preferably something that's not fried, something that's roasted. I think um, now we all need to go research dinner. Um, I don't want to end the conversation, but I do want to be mindful of time in case anyone needs to jump off. So I just want to let everyone know I dropped a feed for, feedback form in the chat. If you could fill that out, that'd be great. It will also be in the email uh, that you get with the recording. Again, this recording will be posted to our YouTube uh, probably this afternoon. And for attending live, you will receive a certificate of attendance today. I do want to say a final thank you. If we'd like to keep talking, I'm happy to do it, but I do uh, want to end the recording just to give a chance for people who want to ask questions if they don't like to be recorded. So again, thank you today. Uh, again, we'll stay on. I am just now going to end the recording. Thank you. Okay.